Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, Norman and I debated who's going to start first, and unfortunately, I lost the argument, so I'm here. Um, we are happy to be speaking to you today um, in the graveyard shif shift. Hopefully, we entertain you a little bit as well. So to start off with, I'm going to just take you, oh, so the agenda, we're going to speak through uh, uh, about the makerspace, um, what the makerspace is doing in an academic library, the impact of COVID on the makerspace service, um, some user feedback, uh, then some collaborations that we have formed, um, how we're looking at developing the service further, and then looking forward. So to start off with, I'm just going to take you through our makerspace uh, in pictures. So this is the big discussion table with some of our um, 3D prints. This is what it looks like from the one corner. Um, and yeah, so this is the design space. The design space is um, primarily for 3D modeling, um, but it has high-end comput uh, computers for other computing services. And then we also have our 3D scanners. So once things are scanned, it can be taken over to the modeling uh, the design stations uh, for further modeling and um, refinement. And then we have our 3D printers, which is just behind the uh, 3D scanner. We've got a construction workspace, which is perfect for um, small robotics work um, with soldering stations and oscilloscopes. And then we've got our workbenches where you can do some finer work um, and finish off your 3D prints. We've got some hand tools there as well as a Dremel tool. So the background to the Stellenbosch University Library Makerspace. So the idea came from a similar sim a symposium, the SU Library Symposium in 2016, where Jerun de Boer spoke about makerspaces, a great opportunity to enhance academic libraries. And in this presentation, he quotes um, and Audrey uh, Waters saying, by and large, these makerspaces are not associated with, with any one department. Indeed, that's the argument that many librarians are making about opening uh, makerspaces with him. The library community is already open to the entire campus community, students and faculty of all disciplines. And so in 2017, as part of the strategic actions, um, the Stellenbosch University Library and Information Service um, launched an investigation into the feasibility of um, the makerspace, of creating a makerspace. And this was done drawing uh, the expertise from various stakeholders on campus. And then further in the annual report of the following year, um, in the concluding remarks, um, the SU list, um, service articulated that we will continue to upgrade and repurpose our libraries to transform them into technology friendly spaces that will facilitate collaborative research and learning. And so um, it comes at no uh, surprise that in the strategic directions for 2021 to 2025, which was the following um, iteration of strategy for the library, that um, there was the objective to optimize innovate innovation spaces for the digital centric and op entrepreneurial user, which is um, exactly where the makerspace falls perfectly in. And so, of course, uh, so the initial idea was to launch the makerspace in 2020 uh, in April. But of course, um, during that time, we were faced with a um, COVID uh, pandemic. And, but that gave us an opportunity to um, have a little bit more focus and time to think about the services that we wish to offer. And so, uh, where am I going next? So next, why a makerspace in an academic library? Uh, so I, I just uh, paraphrased this from um, Burke's 2015 paper on a conference presentation at ACRL. Makerspaces exist outside of spaces dedicated to course-driven assignment or project work, making, in a, making it an ideal space to encourage experimentation beyond the classroom. So this, in turn, he says, allows for the broader application of what has been learned in the classroom, theory-based. And so Curry emphasizes that 
the Makerspace highlights self-directed opportunities because it is a space to uh, tinker and, and innovate um, with supervision, of course, because of health and safety concerns. So placing the Makerspace in a space like the Academic Library where all staff and students have access to the space allows for equal opportunity to use and learn the type the to learn to use the type of tools uh, and services available in the makerspace. And so makerspaces aren't, aren't new to the academe. We know that makerspaces exist in um, uh, discipline spaces like uh, engineering, where they uh, make use of tools for robotics construction and so forth. And so uh, having a makerspace in ac an academic library just brings that uh, equity and equality on campus. Um, in innovation and uh, uh, entrepreneurial um, spaces. And so now I'm going to give over to Norman to speak a bit to you. Is this still my chance? <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, we launched a space during COVID-19 and um, the official launch took place on the 15th of March of this year. And um, in at that launch, the uh, full complement of the uh, university executive was there. So the vice chancellor and the deputy, deputy vice chancellors, um, as well as the COO. And they commented that this was the first time that they've all actually attended an event um, together. And it was, I think, because the launch happened when it happened, it uh, it's it's weird that we're launching a makerspace during COVID because it is a physical space. Um, but because it happened when it happened, um, I think we benefited from drawing some interest around campus. And um, launching during COVID-19 also gave us ample time to think around um, the services that we offer and how we can offer the services um, with small samples of students and um, academics coming to use the different services. So um, when we opened the doors, there wasn't the rush of students, but um, I think we were able to use that to our advantage as well. And so um, in addition to this, uh, we, we do have other, or we had other spaces on campus that uh, were like the Makerspace. One example is the Lens Lab in visuals, uh, Visual Arts, um, and that was an EU-funded project, but the funding came to an end. Um, so they no longer had the expertise within the department to run a makerspace service. And um, Norman will speak later a bit uh, more about collaborations, but this opened the door to um, collaborations. And um, then the other space is uh, one of our commercial spaces, um, the Launch Lab. And the Launch Lab is, uh, is an incubation space, but over time they had also lost a lot of uh, the expertise that they were able to offer. And um, because they do rely on um, paid for services to sus sustain them, um, the model didn't work out during uh, the pandemic. Um, now they are, of course, working on other models um, to build their services around, uh, but it, it just goes to show that um, in the end, for at least for our context, um, the makerspace in the library, the opening and the placement um, coincided in a, in a manner that was actually perfect for us. Yes, and I spoke about this. Um, launching the Makerspace during COVID-19 gave us an opportunity for some deep thinking around the service offerings. And yes, so COVID is still around and it's still a physical space, but we have been able to um, manage how the space is used, how the tools are used um, to keep our users um, safe and healthy. And now it's time for me to give over to Norman. <laughs> specifically about uh, feedback that I've been sending out and giving during this time of all the different tours, some hands-on training sessions, 
and also focusing on a specific training group that we had recently. Right, and but before I look at the results, uh, the reason why we had these surveys was because the Makerspace was a strategic action for the library this year that we wanted to roll out, we wanted to get it going, and also with the elephant in the room, COVID-19, how can we adapt our services as best as possible to serve our community within that uh, limitations, right? So um, this is just the, the survey. Thirty-two percent with twenty-nine respondents, but this wasn't—it um, wasn't always ju just general responses I sent out. I actually had individual discussions with a lot of the groups and a lot of the people. Also, the result, uh, the survey wasn't anonymous either because I was looking for quality feedback. And what I'll show you in the next group was, with the survey results, uh, the academic staff gave the most feedback and actually the most detailed feedback, which was good. That's what I, what I was looking for. And then also library staff gave a, a very good percentage of feedback, but I also found that they were a bit reserved in that, and I'll go into that in a minute. And then um, the general tours, I did get some responses from students and that, and I'll uh, explain that a little bit further. And also my most vocal group was the, the specialist group that we had for training. All right, and I'm gonna discuss two types of responses. It's the, the library staff, and then also more in detail, the academic staff responses. With our own library staff, they actually enjoy the, the technology that's available, but they also wanted to see what our students gonna create. And what I meant by them being reserved is I didn't get the feedback that I was looking for. Nobody m went into a lot of detail, but as time went by, and I actually discussed like certain ideas or issues with the specific, let's say librarians or maybe staff that came for training, they were more comfortable to actually discuss their ideas. And, like you had faculty librarians, how would that relate to their faculties and, and as such? And so then I was getting the feedback that I was looking for. Right, and now just move on to the academic responses. So they were actually very positive and they actually, a lot of academics actually discussed how they can see it being integrated into their curriculum, which is, which I was looking for because in, in philosophy, you get maybe this um, saying that controversy is the lifeblood of philosophy, but with makerspaces, I found actually that collaboration with other groups and departments, that is our lifeblood and how to get students in our space to use it, right? And um, a lot of staff also said they would encourage their students to use it. We also had the first uh, feedbacks from, I'm gonna focus on maybe one department in this talk as well, the visual arts department. That's where it started, um, and I'll explain later how we went into further collaboration with them. Um, another interesting feedback was some academics were actually looking for, um, why don't we advertise more on that? But outside of the traditional advertising methods and also social media, I just found there's certain age groups that maybe needed more direct contact, and they weren't on social media platforms and as such. And with that, we used the faculty librarians that had strong relationships with different departments to actually advertise our services and got feedback from that, and also direct contact with certain groups, right? There was also a previous lab called Idea to Product, and they no longer doing 3D printing for students and staff, and so how we collaborate is they refer their students to us and we advertise their maybe their CT scanning, which is x-ray scanning and very specialized scanning. And 
and that. Right, and there was also um, a request for actually 3D printing during tours. But the way we do 3D printing, it's uh, printing on demand, and once people have paid for it, we go through a certain process. But so we try to coordinate our 3D printing with those kind of tours, but also very specifically, not just at the start or if it's finished 3D printing, but let's about halfway. It's just to get people to actually see that visualization of the 3D printing, not just doing something, but they can actually recognize the object that is being printed, right? And I've had a few comments on like that with people that have never actually seen 3D printing work before. Um, I did have some academic staff requiring more technical demos, right? And that's why I've started actually lengthening the introductory tours, but also not too much because I also had academics saying, you can't get too technical because some of the students won't actually understand the terms and that. So I always tailor the, uh, the introductions to whoever's actually partaking and also academics as well and see how we can relate that tour, what the services we offered to that specific group. Okay, now I'm going to also look at the training calendar tour responses. And if you're wondering what iPad stands are doing up there, one of the first comments I got was, um, because I was using maybe a more traditional method of actually getting the reviews in that, uh, the responses from academic staff was good, right? But I found that students wanted a more instant method of actually providing feedback. Because sometimes once they, they've moved on to something else during the day, they've completely forgotten what they, where they were at, right? So basically, um, this is also upcycling old iPads. It's assets that you couldn't consider that had no longer use. But there's two things that those old iPads were like over nine years old could do. They could stay on for a few hours and they can project an image, right? But they, you, there's also limitations. You can't update apps, a lot of other technical things. But in doing this, it's perfect. I mean, it's very easy to push out for maybe a tour where people can just scan the QR code with their phone and it'll instantly go to the survey, a library guide, or more electronic resources for those tours. And I think I found that that's actually a very good fit for uh, that kind of asset in reusing it. Um, I also had some good responses from like your undergraduate and postgraduate students because they also said, because we limited the, the amount of people that could come in, it allowed for more discussion and feedback uh, as well. But I also had responses where they did want um, longer tours, more interaction, but I also had to balance that with the COVID regulations at that time as well, right? Next section. And these are examples from uh, or projects I'm looking into because of the responses that they want. So especially with 3D printing, that I want to just see like maybe smaller projects or something. Um, I had a lot of engineering students looking for maybe something mechanical, right? That incorporates different sections, but something much larger. And on that side, you can actually, it's a Zortrax arm, mechanical arm, and the thing is quite large, and I'm looking to develop that myself. But just to show the design through that, and also maybe using different filaments, as Zortrax is a 3D printer we use, and we use their filament, just to give them maybe like uh, an effect of what are, what are the physical properties of those filaments? Because people want to see the actual physical um, print before they maybe decide on something that they want to print. Um, and another thing, example I'm looking at is actually scanning an object and reprinting it. But this is actually without post-processing. Because uh, you can't expect, you've got to maybe just tackle that myth that you just open the 3D printer door and that's all finished and nicely done. But you've got to involve students where there is always post-processing, and sometimes it's actually a lot more. And that's a good example in our next um, example that we had. This is from a visual art student. So basically what it is, it's um, melting art, right? So we printed it in like a semi-transparent filament, 
and the, the shine effect that you're getting, that comes with the post-processing of acetone evaporation. Right? But also, what other students wanted to see, like say, our engineering students, they wanted to see projects from other faculties. And with uh, the students' permission, we'll maybe recreate this to use as examples in tours, where people can just see and get ideas from other departments on how they actually, or just to get that inspiration. That's what I found. Okay, now I'm going into the, like the specialist groups. Um, it's very interesting to note some of their responses. Where, how do you feel that your knowledge and services of training available in the makerspace has improved? A large portion is yes, some is maybe, and one respondent was no. And I found this very interesting. Also the, the overall experience of the tour. But this group was with us for two weeks and I decided to actually do introduction right in the beginning because they've never been there and actually do another survey during that time that they were actually with us right and and then I'll talk about those results a little bit later um, this is one example that I'm actually looking at for using on those kind of students but also on a, on a greater uh, aspect if you don't know what this is it's actually a Newtonian reflecting telescope that can actually disassemble. It's mostly 3D printed and can fit actually into your hand luggage that you can actually travel with, right? And the different aspects, especially with maybe these kind of students, is maybe all of it can be 3D printed, but some of the elements you maybe want to use carbon fiber to increase the lightness of it. Uh, there's certain elements that you cannot uh, 3D print, like your parabolic mirrors, that you either have to import, scavenge from an old telescope, or actually hand make it. So it just gives maybe um, students, like the creative students or engineering students, uh, aspects on, like let's say if you change the size of it, that affects the focal ratio of the mirrors. So you've got to take a lot into consideration. Also, if you're prototyping this product, the cost of your materials and things like that. Okay, now this is the, the hands-on training sessions, right? As you can see, the results are it's very satisfied and satisfied. And I found that there was an increase in the positivity rate of students from, let's say, just a general tour to when they actually spend time actually doing the project. And with those training sessions, we kept it to maybe a maximum of four people. We didn't have any student sharing projects. There was two staff members to support these students. And you see, and then actually got a much better feedback. And the feedback I got was a lot more positive and how they can carry on with electronics, registry for other courses and that. Okay, now I'm gonna investigate like Makerspace as a training venue. This was actually the group that we used, right? And the question, one of the questions I posed to them, does it meet your expectations? And it was completely yes. But plus other questions in that review, so where they actually stated they, they weren't like no maybe, but that was because of fear of technology, right? And when the students engaged more with the space, they actually became less fearful because the students were actually honest. The one said, I'm not tech savvy. I feel very intimidated by this technology. So you've also got to take into account uh, with a scenario like this, how can you um, discuss this with a lecture? How can you best support these students with this kind of fear? And as you can see, um, it was very fluid during the, the two weeks that they were there. The students can come and go between the demonstrations and their crits. Um, this is just a quick example of what they designed in those two weeks and a, a quote for pushing the envelope there. And these models would be actually later 3D printed. Um, I also asked how do they find the equipment and, and the software because we were um, very focused on actual the design aspect with this group, uh, they actually pushed the limits of our PCs, even though we got very high-end PCs. But it's good to have this kind of feedback on a yearly basis, so you can actually just see that your equipment matches um, the software requirements released every time. But also with this, uh, we used open source software where we could use an education license, but this was actually commercial grade software that they needed with our own IT department and another IT department on campus. We managed to have it installed on these PCs at a short notice 
and that is actually good when you've got a smaller footprint. Because if you're looking at a, maybe a larger lab, it becomes more difficult because they've got yearly cycles when they do um, software upgrades and that. And this is the actual group that we used for the last two weeks. But remember, these results are specific to this group. Um, and with the collaborations that we've had from academic departments, this is one of them where it started out like that because they had their own kind of maker space for their needs, but that, because they ran out of funding, that closed, so they needed another place to actually work in and that. And even though um, they actually do have their still their own 3D printers, we actually offer different expertise and maybe different filaments that they actually don't have, right? And also in some of my training sections, I'm actually providing maybe a, a feeder for, let's say, students that want to do more advanced CAD design because the department also hosts part-time CAD courses. And also this is a possibility for other departments on campus where you actually provide introductory and then giving them feeder students for their more advanced courses. And also there's collaborations with other departments, maybe taking over redundant equipment. And also if you've got your own space, think of that because you might not have to always lay out the equipment and that. So it's all about collaboration with other departments especially. But let me just finish up now because I've got Jeremiah waiting for me to carry on. So um, I think, yeah, you can come up. <laughs> we, we are actually running out of time here. Thanks, Norman. <coughs> yeah, so I've got four minutes left. And so, um, you know, when launching a space like a makerspace, we, of course, did our homework. Um, uh, but before my time, there were uh, visits to other makerspaces, including the makerspace at the U University of Pretoria. Um, but uh, one of the important things that um, I've noted for many years in digital scholarship is that um, each campus culture, each academic culture uh, at a university is different. And so you adapt services according to the academic and the research culture. So for further development, we are trying to be as flexible as we can within our um, constraints, whether it's money, time, space. Um, and But we are constantly looking at how we can further develop. So in Norman's example with the visual arts uh, students, they are making use of a specific software for their 3D modeling. And they happen to have uh, quite a few licenses just laying around not being used. And um, it was important for, for me uh, to um, be able to make the decision uh, or, yeah, to be able to motivate for these licenses to be transferred because we need to have what the students are using. We need to have what is used by industry. Um, and that's another level of um, what they call it, uh, graduate preparedness. And so uh, looking forward, um, as I said, we are with a lot of the makerspace, we are still in the space where we are seeing how our equipment is being used. So um, we are still deciding where, where we are heading, but we are excited because of the, the collaborations and the conversations that we are having with some departments already. The main conversations, of course, happening with visual arts. Um, we are also looking at how we can um, connect our spaces, maybe not physically, but um, uh, so I, as uh, Naomi um, introduced me, I manage the learning commons as well. And I'm really trying to um, think about how I can connect these two spaces in the sense that the learning uh, commons discussion rooms can contribute to um, a sort of design thinking space um, that then partners with the makerspace in um, becoming the idea space and the makerspace being the prototyping space. And then lastly, I think we are continually working on developing expertise. So um, having this, the visual arts class learning on their software, the lecturer giving demonstrations was a valuable opportunity for our staff in the makerspace to also become somewhat familiar or at least exposed to a, a, a new modeling software that ca could have other applications outside of what the art students were using it for. And that's my story with, or our story, with one minute left. <laughs>